Welcome to Clock Global Institute 2021. It is my privilege to welcome you to this, our second ever all virtual Global Institute. You know, Clock has always been about change, right? It's who we are as a community, as an organization, we are always pushing forward. It's one of the many things I love about the amazing people that make up Clock. We don't hold back from risks and challenges. We look to the future, not the past. And I've been thinking a lot about change myself lately, about milestones, about new challenges. And as many of you know, I've recently made the decision to leave my position as Director of Legal Operations at Google to take on a new role as Chief Community Officer at Ironclad. And so to avoid any possibility of conflict of interest, I'm very sadly stepping down as your president. Let me start by saying two things. First, I could not be more excited for and confident in my dear friend and colleague, Mike Haven, who is stepping into this role. Those of you who have been here with us for a while all know Mike. He's a great leader, he's an awesome person, Someone with such passion for this community and for this mission, he is the perfect person to drive and grow this amazing community. And he has a wonderful team around him. Our executive director, Betsy Roach, our world-class board members, and our great volunteer leaders. With all their energy and direction, Clock is poised for more great things in the future. Second, I want to be clear that while I'm changing roles, I remain and will always remain a committed and enthusiastic member of this community. I won't be your president anymore, but I'm gonna be right by your side, part of this incredible global movement. I could never walk away from CLOCK. What attracted me to Ironclad actually, a CLOCK sponsor, is how aligned they are to our mission, that mission to redefine the business of law. I'm gonna still be fighting the same fight. So this is a bittersweet moment for me. On the one hand, I've been involved in clock leadership either as a board member or as the president for over 11 years. It's been such a big part of my personal life, my professional life. You know, when people used to ask me what I did in my free time, my answer was always, I do clock. So of course, closing this chapter of my clock journey is hard. On the other hand, I know that as I said, clock is about change. We don't stand still, we embrace big challenges. And that is what I'm doing now as I begin a new chapter in my own legal operations story. And most important of all, I know that clock will grow and thrive under Mike and his new team. I look forward to the amazing things that are gonna come from this community. So one last time, let me just say a final thank you from the bottom of my heart to all of you. I have so deeply appreciated the opportunity to help guide and grow this organization and this community and this movement. And now let me hand it over to Mike. Thank you, Mary. You've been so important to making CLOCK what it is today, a force for positive change in our industry. I know I speak for all of us when I say how much I appreciate your immense contributions to this organization, to the field of legal operations, and to our industry. I look forward to building on this great foundation and to working with our amazing community to keep expanding and deepening our reach and impact. And to all CLOCK members and friends, let me just say how honored I am to be addressing you as your new president. I've been handed a torch that was lit by a small group of pioneers nearly a decade ago and carried by great leaders before me. As the next torch bearer, I'll work with each of you to fan that flame and inspire a new generation of legal radicals dedicated to transforming our industry. But this is not about me. It's about us. This is our movement. I may not be with you in person right now, but believe me, I feel so connected to all of you. 
I remember the early days of our community, which started as a little book club of like-minded people, exchanging ideas and practices and supporting each other. Back then, most of what legal operations is today was still considered revolutionary. People thought we were crazy for even whispering some of the things that today everyone is shouting from the rooftops. Clock has played a huge role in the explosion of legal operations. The seed was planted right here. This community has helped countless legal teams and individual careers. The industry took notice, general counsels took notice, and now running legal departments like a business is considered just plain common sense. To see how far we've come, just look at who's with us today. We have people joining from all over the world, representing a broad range of perspectives. Many of us are part of in-house legal ops teams, yes. But now we have law firms, next generation service providers, technology companies, and educators all diving into our community. We have people just starting their careers and people like me, who've been at this for long enough to remember how different it was just a few years ago. As we grow, it's even more important that we think about our purpose, our why. We talk a lot about changing the, in the legal industry. We don't always talk enough about that why. The truth is that why has evolved over the years. Legal operations really began around the turn of the century when the dot-com bubble burst and CFOs struggling to preserve resources began to pay more attention to legal spend. Back then, the why was pretty simple, find ways to save money. Fast forward to the Great Recession in 2008. Legal ops gained more steam as legal departments began to push for meaningful changes to the way their teams worked. The field began to evolve and broaden, and the why became, how can we do it better, faster, more efficiently? The next stage of our evolution came a handful of years later, when those lonely, isolated legal ops pioneers began to come together and coalesce into a community. This was the book club that later became Clock. This emerging community was defined by a fierce commitment to sharing, to innovation, and to mutuality. I'll never forget our first institute in San Francisco in 2016. It was a magical moment in time. A group of 500 legal pioneers together in one room, about to embark on a journey that would transform a massive industry. We started to look at things more holistically, stepping out of a narrow legal operations perspective. Our why expanded yet again, from supporting individual roles in legal departments to how can we make our industry work better in every dimension? That brings us to now. Today, I believe that we're entering a new stage, not just for legal ops, but for clock itself, we must adjust our purpose, our focus for the next great leap forward. I believe that our mission must include and address the entire ecosystem more fully than it has in the past. One of the great lessons from the pandemic is that we're better as a society when we work together. The same is true for our industry. We cannot be splintered, siloed, divided, conflicted. We cannot afford to become insular. Think about what CLOCK does best. When I talk to people about what defines this community, I keep hearing one thing. When you strip everything else away, we are problem solvers. We come from many backgrounds, but we have one important thing in common.
We are the people who always believe there's a better way. And we work tirelessly to find it. In that spirit, we must work together across industry lines to bust silos and build bridges across the ecosystem. As we move forward, our problems are only becoming more complex. To solve them, we must act as one. We cannot rely exclusively on our own limited tool sets. We must start pulling in other experts and voices. No one has all the answers. Almost everything requires a combination of skills and approaches. That is how we'll find the best answers. That is how we'll uncover the next wave of breakthrough ideas and solutions that will drive success for everyone who works in our industry. That is how we'll live up to our vision to redefine the business of law. This brings me to the single most vital area where I believe we have to make progress. We must push harder, much harder, to make our industry more representative, inclusive, and equitable. When it comes to cultural and racial diversity, our industry remains stuck in the past. We have to stop asking for change and start demanding it. We cannot keep accepting the unacceptable. We need real progress, not the slow crawling pace that we see today. I love that we're seeing more companies using their market power to push for change. For example, by choosing to work only with partners who meet certain standards for diversity and inclusion. That matters and makes a real difference. Still, Realigning incentives and pressures within the industry is not enough. We have to look at access at all levels, particularly when it comes to the pipeline of young people entering the field. We must make legal more compelling and accessible for a new generation of diverse professionals. This means finding ways to locate and influence talented young people who previously would not have considered or been considered by the legal field. There's a lot of good work being done there, including by my own department at Intel, but we need so much more. When we bring more diverse candidates forward into our space, we're making a long-term investment in shifting the entrenched systems and culture of our industry. That matters so much. In CLOCK, we've shown that we have the collective will and power to alter the trajectory of our industry in other areas. Let's work together to find ways to push legal forward in this, the most important challenge of all. Ultimately, when we talk about our purpose, our why, we're really asking ourselves a simple question. What do we really care about? Solving problems in our businesses, working with our ecosystem partners to find new answers, finding ways to work smarter and faster. Of course, those things matter. You could call them matters of the mind and they're important for sure. We've focused and made a lot of progress on those matters over the years and we still have much to do there. But I want to talk about some things you could call matters of the heart. Justice, fairness, equity, representation, empathy. These matter even more. We've been mostly focused on our matters of the mind while ramping up this emerging field and have not yet done enough to further these matters of the heart to tackle these critical problems. It is time, past time, that we push these issues into the spotlight. As a community, as an industry, and frankly, as a society, we're at a turning point. We've built CLOCK into a powerful organization. It's time to get real about how we use that power and reach. The story of CLOCK is the story of change. 
we've always evolved, grown, transformed. It's up to us to pick the direction and purpose of that change. Any version of our purpose, of our collective why, that doesn't put these matters of the heart front and center is, in my opinion, unacceptable. As I close, I wanna thank the most important people of all, you, our members. Thank you for your time, energy, and ideas. Clock is about you. You are the ones that make up this vibrant community. Our job as leaders is simply to try to channel and serve this amazing global movement. This is a community that's built on mutual support, selflessness, and the sharing of ideas. It belongs to each of you just as much as it belongs to me or anyone else on the leadership team. We're just stewards. You are everything. You know, I've shared a lot today about where I want Clock to progress. Now I want to introduce the single most important person in terms of getting all that done. She's our amazing executive director, Betsy Roach. I'm so happy to have her and her strong team in place to help us accomplish our goals and keep our focus where it counts on our members. Over to you, Betsy. Thank you, Mike. I've had the opportunity to work with you already for some time now, and it makes me so happy that I get to work with you in your new role. And I could not agree with you more. This is a really important time for CLOCK and for legal operations. It's hard to believe that it's been one year since I took the role of executive director, and it's been quite a journey. Here we are putting on our second all virtual global institute. One thing about the CLOCK community, as Mike said, we solve problems. When circumstances change, we find ways to adapt. So we found new ways to make progress, to stay connected, and to add value to members over the past year. We did a quick pivot to an online learning and webinar series that led to over 4,800 registrations and several publications with over 6,400 impressions. We held our first ever virtual institute with over 1,400 attendees from six continents. We introduced new types of smaller scale virtual events that allowed us to reach law school students at Peking University, General Counsel in Africa, and many other countries and regions. And through it all, we kept growing. We now count 2,800 members across 48 countries. As we look to the future, we know that same spirit of innovation, creativity, and community will continue to be important to clock and part of our culture. We view 2021 as a bridge year where we continue to serve members online while getting closer to the point where we can all be together again. So our talented and fabulous staff team has created new opportunities for digital learning and engagement. We have Ask the Experts, Solution Labs, Huddles, Mentoring, and so much more. We're also enhancing our online community platform to make it easier for people to engage. We wanna make it easy for anyone to get the answer they need or connect with someone facing a similar challenge. You also heard Mike speak about the importance of engaging with the entire ecosystem. That is why we collaborate with groups like ACC, the Association of Corporate Counsel, ACEDS, the Association of E-Discovery Specialists, and She Breaks the Law. Looking forward, I think we're all eager for next year and the opportunity to all be together at the 2022 Global Institute in Las Vegas in what will surely be an incredible gathering after more than two years apart. I know I'm really looking forward to being there in person and meeting you all. We're also excited for our in-person EMEA Summit in London this coming January and an APAC Summit later next fall. But now I wanna wrap things up and get you into what you came for the 2021 Clock Global Institute. We have a wonderful event planned for you. We know that the 12 hour day was hard on some of you last time. So we are taking a staged multi-day approach. We also have designed new learning formats to better engage over the virtual platform. I trust you'll enjoy the outstanding speakers and high quality education coming your way. Thank you to our speakers and our generous sponsors, including Bloomberg Law, sponsor of today's general counsel panel. They all have so much insight and knowledge to share. 
for the next couple of days. Enjoy the sessions, take part in our networking offerings, and know that this week's event is just a small sampling of what we offer. Enjoy the Global Institute. Welcome everyone to the Legal Operations of Tomorrow, the GC Perspective Panel Discussion. We're so thrilled that you're here with us today. And a big thank you to our general session sponsor, Bloomberg Law, for supporting this session and the Clock Global Institute. My name is Farrah Pepper. I'm the Chief Legal Innovation Counsel at Marsh McLennan. And I'm also delighted to say I became a Clock Board member earlier this year. And I could not be more tickled pink to have the group that we have here today to speak with you. We are joined today by three fantastic general counsel who understand the importance of legal operations and have amazing insights into what the future might bring for the profession. So we're going to have each of these amazing GCs introduce themselves in more depth tell you a little bit about where they started, the journey that they've been through, and where they are now. Uh, so with that, I would just say thank you for being here, Rachel, Mark, and Amy, and let's dive in. Rachel, let's start with you. Please tell us about your story. So I started with a passion at a young age to be a lawyer. Uh, when I was 17 years old, uh, I got a parking ticket and argued my way out of it, and the judge said to me, now you go be an attorney. And I said, thank you, Your Honor, I will. <laughs> I enjoyed problem solving. Uh, I wanted to win the arguments. I mostly uh, wanted to win the arguments against my two older brothers. I like to take complex concepts and simplify them. And I wanted to make law more pragmatic and relatable to anyone who wanted to learn and listen. I graduated from Columbia Law School, uh, where I've now since gone back and I teach a course there, one that's pragmatic, of course. I clerked on the Delaware Court of Chancery, and then I started out as a securities litigator at Scout and Arps. Uh, one of my first cases uh, was representing Jerry Yang and Microsoft's attempted takeover of Yahoo, uh, which uh, to, to this day, um, they did not take over Yahoo. Maybe they should have for $44 billion at the time. Uh, I was thrusted uh, very early on uh, in high profile cases, uh, moving expeditedly and fast at Scannon. Whether it was representing Rupert Murdoch in a securities case, Bank of America during the subcribe crisis or the, the Vendee and Activision merger, I liked the pressure uh, and I thrived under it. One of our clients at Scannon was a travel company called Travel Zoo, and they had hired a new CFO who had just come over as the controller from eBay. And at this point, I was running a number of legal matters for Travel Zoo while I was at Skadden. And so one day while I was at my office, and I still remember this day, um, the phone rang and uh, the new CFO from Travel Zoo called and said, would you consider leaving and joining to be Travel Zoo's general counsel, which is a, a publicly traded company? And at the time, um, this was uh, many years ago, I would have was one of the youngest females of a general counsel of a publicly traded company. And so that same week though, uh, when Travel Zoo called, a recruiter also called me, a recruiter named Sean. And he said, would you like to lead a securities practice at another firm? And so it's interesting how the universe works and they presented these two options. So at that point I had sort of this three-way crossroads where I could become a general counsel, which to be honest, I knew nothing about. Uh, I was a securities litigator at Scadden at the time. I could join this other firm's practice and lead their securities practice, or I could find a home at Scadden. Uh, and I felt like I definitely had that option to, to stay at Scadden uh, in the long run. So it was 4th of July weekend. I had one toddler at that point, and um, I decided to take the leap of faith. And I joined Travel Zoo, and I started my career uh, as general counsel uh, at Travel Zoo in-house. 
uh, to be honest, I always thought to myself, well, if the, this doesn't work out, I'll just call back the law firms um, and figured that that was something that um, could definitely uh, happen if it didn't work out at the end. After five great years with Travel Zoo, I was recruited over uh, to Brooks Brothers. Uh, by this point, uh, I was co-teaching a class at Columbia Law School entitled Exploring the Role of the General Counsel. And I just written a book called The Short and Happy Guide to Business Contracts because after going in house, I, I noticed very quickly that people needed like a, a short and happy dummies guide to, to marking up, negotiating and understanding in a more practical way, business contracts. So I drafted that book and uh, put it on Amazon. When Brooks Brothers approached uh, me, they were an R, America's oldest apparel brand. It was appealing to me. I love the history of Brooks Brothers. I love that they dressed every single president or nearly every president. It's, it had a company with a heritage. It had an iconic American brand with over 200 years of history. And I also really liked the clothing and the clothing discount. So that um, was great. But what attracted me to the role in 2019 at the time, um, if you had told me that in 2020, all of Brooks Brothers stores were gonna be closed, the US factories were gonna have nothing to sell because ties, suits, and dress shirts don't go well with a uh, national pandemic. We would be severely financially distressed without revenue from the stores. Our banks would close in on us. Oh, and this is all gonna happen in a matter of weeks. Um, I'm not really sure I would have picked retail um, to go into at that time. But within this short period of time in 2020, we were able to pivot the factories into making face masks and PPE for the US Navy. We ended up selling the factories. We obtained financing. We ran a heated sales process of Brooks Brothers played out through the media. We filed chapter 11 bankruptcy. We then had a stalking horse uh, to acquire Brooks Brothers within the chapter 11 bankruptcy. We received an $80 million financing loan for free to get us through successfully the bankruptcy. We concluded the sales process. We successfully emerged. All of our stores are largely saved and so are all the jobs. So that has been a pretty busy 2020 uh, and a few months uh, going through um, that process. And um, Brooks Brothers also managed to um, sell sweatpants too because that was the first time we did that uh, given uh, the Zoom uh, situation, um, you can now buy Brooks Brothers sweatpants. So we, we launched new products. Um, at the time when I could uh, finally catch my breath and the sale process had gone through and we were integrating with the new company, um, who is doing an excellent job expanding the product line right now, that same recruiter from eight, nine years ago that I mentioned, Sean, called me back up. So it shows you in life, you never know who's going to uh, come back in your life. And he said, do I have the role for you? You are absolutely perfect for this role. Uh, there, there is this uh, stock exchange, IEX, that goes to your securities background. Um, and we think this is a perfect combination because they also have a noble purpose of bringing fairness and transparency into the market uh, and to level the playing field for all investors. And that to me was very appealing to me. And I thought that this was a great next step to be a chief legal officer going back to my roots as a securities lawyer and also a travel zoo where I'd done um, a lot of technology integration and technology uh, growth. And so last month uh, I uh, left retail uh, clothing and joined IEX as the chief legal officer. And uh, some of you might've heard the company, it was uh, based on Michael Lewis's book from Flash Boys. And it is a US equities exchange uh, that is setting a new standard for national securities markets in the US. And our mission is to protect the investor. And I think that's a very important um, mission and something that you know, I'm proud to join. So that is my story. And that is uh, how I got uh, to the position that I am today. Fabulous. Thank you, Rachel. And I'm not sure we actually said it, but your full name is Rachel Barnett, uh, just so we're clear on, on uh, who we're talking to here. I love that story. And I also love the idea that Brooks Brothers pivoted and now you can get sweatshirts there. It really is. It's a huge statement of just about the craziness of this past year. High is low and everyone's changing their model. So thank you for sharing that. That was tremendous. Mark, let's hear from you next. Please tell us your journey and your story. 
Hi guys, I'm Mark Cho, and, and number one, I'm, I'm really happy to be among such great company here with the, in the Clock Forum. Um, I mean, look, I, I, Rachel, the amazing story. We all have amazing stories. For me, I'm actually an accidental lawyer. I never, I sort of didn't grow up thinking I was going to be an attorney or lawyer in that sense. I was actually in graduate school. Ended up thinking about something I wanted to do. Went to law school. You know, people said, oh, "Are you going to be a professor? Are you going to do this?" And I realized. Yeah. You know, what I really wanted to do was go out and do something and work with teams. And then sort of the natural progression there, pretty conventional story, you know, was in big law for many years doing really what I'm doing now in a different capacity, investment management. So private equity funds, hedge funds, investing, sort of that whole universe training there. But I think for me, just to where I where I am now, right now, I'm, I'm the general counsel of B Capital Group. It's a global venture capital firm. And we you know, we invest and try to accelerate and expand our, our, our partner portfolio companies. Sort of in a nutshell, that's what we do. But how I got here is, you know, when I look at it, it's a long, it's a long path to where, I've, where, where I am now. But really, I look at two moments. And I think this is in terms of anyone's career. I, you know, when you're working and you have a lot to do and sort of things are piling up, but you, you handle that sort of on a day-to-day -day level. You know, I always look to mentors or moments where people have sort of expanded the horizon of my perspective, right? Number one is, you know, both two places, one in, at the law firm I was at, you know, as a six year really sort of grinding, doing a lot of work, sort of thinking about staying at the firm. And then number two, at my first in-house position, um, the mentorship of the ideas there that sort of I encountered, that's, that's what's really guided me to where I am now. And the law firm, it was sort of, you know, same thing, doing a lot of work, interacting with clients. Um, you know, getting great training, but really, uh, you know, at that point, sort of questioning whether I wanted to be in a law firm or not. And I think the, the biggest moment there was one of my biggest clients who I worked on probably 60 to 70 percent of my time. A uh, very senior legal um, person there was just asked me, you know, point blank, why are you still there? What are you doing? Your perspective is probably beyond, you know, what you always question and what you want to do is beyond sort of the the specialization that you're going into. And at that point, I had, uh, you know, I had my first young son, uh, you know, we're, we're in Manhattan, we're living, we're sort of like going down a rabbit hole path. And that really sort of, that, that spurred me to look into, you know, moving in-house. Um, and sort of that was my first real expansion of my sort of out of, um, out of law firm network in terms of understanding what in-house counsel and then general counsels do in this role. And that, from my perspective and when I thought about my personality really um, pushed me to, to drive forward in that. And that's, you know, after a while you go through these questions about do you stay or you don't, but I took the leap and that leap has been probably the best decision of my life and my career in terms of where I, where I am now, what I'm doing. Um, my second one was that my first, honestly, my first um, in-house position is a place called Oak Hill Advisors, a big multi-strategy um, um, investment firm. There, I had another great mentor. I, I'm lucky in terms of I seek them out and I try to do that with my own sort of mentees now to sort of, you know, give my perspective on career roles or anything in terms of, you know, people thinking about what they want to do. Um, there was the former, um, former uh, global general counsel of Citigroup. And I was running a division there. And um, he just said to me, again, same thing, having conversations. Why are you still here? go leave, go become a general counsel. It suits your personality, all this other stuff. So I think for me, um, in terms of just getting to where I am and, and building that perspective, it's always been, you know, having that mentorship and those relationships that sort of pull you out of that rabbit hole and let you see another horizon or another role. And that for me has been, you know, now in the general counsel or multiple places, um, again, has been another leap and a great push to where I am now where, at this point, it really is about, you know, looking at a business and looking at a team and understanding how to run that with a legal background, not coming in as a lawyer first, but becoming sort of almost having a business perspective and the business uh, rationale with the legal expertise attached to that. That's, that's you know, for me, the mentorship has always been sort of the, the thing that's pulled me out and made me look at a new horizon or a new sort of plateau to get to. So that's, that's my journey in a nutshell. A little, a little more about sort of the the people pushing me or guiding me to that path. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Mark. So that was wonderful. And now we turn to our last but not least general counsel on today's panel. Amy, we'd love to hear from you. How did you get to where you are now? Well, you know, I'm so impressed with uh, Rachel and Mark's stories. Uh, mine just a, a little bit different, which is great. Uh, so a panel of three with different uh, approaches. Um, <clears throat> when I graduated um, law school, uh, it was difficult to be able to, I went to a small um, law school in um, <clears throat> New England and it wasn't necessarily where I wanted to stay. And so um, it was uh, quite the uh, process of selling myself um, across the board to both uh, law firms as well as to uh, in-house jobs. And I was fortunate um, to um, go directly from law school to IBM. At that point, IBM um, hired only out of law school. Um, and so they had their own um, program. And I spent the next uh, 18 years uh, with IBM learning um, uh, all about uh, the business uh, and sort of being uh, in-house counsel for both you know, development, um, you know, I supported the HR team, I supported development teams, um, sales teams, and also gave me a chance to be able to um, move around the world and actually learn uh, what it's like um, as a global company. So I spent some time in Paris <clears throat> and in Madrid, um, being able to uh, work for IBM uh, in supporting those businesses. Um, and then um, when I came back from Europe, one of my, uh, it's sort of a little bit what Rachel says, you know, and uh, Mark, as far as their, um, you know, whether it's mentors or recruiters, you know, you know um, there's a reason why things happen, right? Um, and so when I came back to the US, a former client of mine had just become uh, the CEO of uh, what was CA um, Technologies. Um, and uh, CA was a mess, um, you know, so it was, uh, it had a monitor, it was under a deferred prosecution agreement, you know, you name the problem, it had it, right? Um, and so, you know, I remember deciding whether, you know, to leave sort of, you know, 18 years of IBM of being able to uh, sort of venture out, you know, on my own. Um, and, um, you know, it, it was a very pragmatic decision. Um, at that time, I said to myself, I could, um, you know, work for IBM for X number of years, or I can actually take this job and likely retire in half the time right, and do other things that I'd like to do in life, right, so it became a very, uh, you know, pragmatic decision about one of the best decisions I've ever made, not because of uh, financially, but really the opportunity to be able to sort of spread your wings and to be able to really make a difference, um, because by the time um, I had been in IBM for 18 years, you know, I reported to the general counsel, I worked a great deal, but I really didn't feel like I was making a difference, so it was a perfect opportunity to be able to take a leap of faith with uh, one of my former clients. And uh, I work with, um, I work for CA as the general counsel <clears throat> for, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for eight years. Uh, and um, it's very interesting because, you know, as a lawyer, you know, so many of the things that we um, <clears throat> make decisions about, um, you know, very few of them ever um, come to be questioned. What was really interesting about my time in CA um, was, <clears throat> with the monitor, the monitor knew more than I did. And so every time I made a decision or a risk based a judgment call, uh, the monitor was there to second guess what I was doing, right? Immediately in real time, right? So great um, sort of opportunity to be tested um, uh, on a consistent basis. I left um, uh, CA after eight years and, uh, you know, I never had a job. Like if you think about um, my, in my roles at IBM, I never had a job for eight years, the same job. So it was, uh, it was really great to be able to uh, have the opportunity to, uh, as uh, one of the board members told me, uh, one of the best compliments I've, I've received was that I left CA in a much better place than I found it. Um, and so it was time to be able to uh, sort of move on. And, um, you know, my whole goal with uh, CA had already been accomplished was to make it a normal software company. Um, and uh, I then decided to take a leap of faith because one more time, because I had a uh, two sons who were already uh, off to college. And so instead of uh, them leaving me, uh, I decided to leave them. So my husband and I moved from the East Coast to the West Coast, and I took an opportunity to be able to work with Avaya. Um, and at the time, you know, Avaya was owned a um, uh, private company. Uh, I was brought in to be able to take the company public. I was owned half owned by Silver Lake and half owned by uh, TPG. So it was my opportunity to not just work in a public environment, but to be able to, you know, work with private equity, which is really, you know, interesting. Who knew that I came in there and, um, and in my three plus years at uh, Avaya, 
I had to be able to take them through um, restructuring and bankruptcy to um, end up as a um, uh, public uh, reemerge with a Avaya um, in a far better place um, as far as being able to now being public and it's it's doing fabulously well um, under the under uh, the new management. So uh, with that, I got the um, opportunity of a lifetime, um, which is um, where I am now, is that I'm the general counsel of um, VMware. And uh, VMware is one of the you know, top five enterprise software companies that you've probably never heard of um, before if you're not in tech. Um, and um, really uh, fabulous opportunity with a growth company. I remember um, interviewing uh, at VMware and they said, Amy, why would you wanna come to VMware? And you know, it was just very simple. You know, one is, um, you know, I really wanted, I struggled through all of, um, you know, as a general counsel, I was working with companies that were really good companies with good people, but struggling to grow. Um, and so all I wanted to do was be on a winning team and to grow uh, and to have some fun. Because while I learned a lot, you know, as a GC by that time for over 11 years, I really wanted to be able to work on a winning team and have a bit more fun than I was, uh, I was having uh, in those sort of pressure tested um, environments. And so I've been the GC um, at uh, VMware now for, um, you know, almost coming up on, uh, on, four, on four years. And uh, I was laughing because um, I have been through uh, seven CEOs, right, in my, uh, my time as being uh, uh, um, a general counsel. So I was like, oh my goodness, who's going to hire me, right? Uh, you know, that should be a warning sign if you're going to uh, hire me as your, um, as your GC, if you're uh, the next, if you're the CEO. But what's sort of interesting about, you know, I think I really believe that, you know, things happen for a reason. And so what's so interesting is, is that you look back and you say, you know, um, VMware had a beer, has a, still has. Um, we recently announced the, um, that we will um, be spun off uh, from Dell Technologies. Today, we're a public company, but also Dell Technology owns 80% uh, of uh, the company. And so as of... Um, uh, fourth quarter of this year will be spun out as a completely uh, independent company. But what was great about it is this, that you go back and you go, okay, I worked um, somewhat like as a division counsel when I was with IBM. So I worked with Dell in relationship to being sort of that division counsel. Uh, and I also um, was a, you know, at CA for eight years, I was the general counsel of a publicly traded company. And I also worked with public, you know, private equity. And so part of, um, uh, the ownership structure at VMware was also that Silver Lake was a, a significant investor in both Dell and, uh, and VMware. So, you know, I'd like to be able to look back and go, there was a reason, you know, you couldn't quite see it then as to sort of that path that looked like happenstance, but seems to have uh, ended in a place uh, in which, you know, all those experiences um, came, to be, came to bear. And I think a little bit like Mark with um, people pushing you along, you know, all I wanted in the beginning was to be able to be a lawyer and to have a you know challenging job and to be paid reasonably well. Um, and you know, it is by the grace of so many people who have thought um, um, that I could do more, even when I didn't want to do more. That kept pushing me to be able to do more and different and interesting things. Um, and so, the best part of my job now is to be able to give back, right? Um, so I am so fortunate um, to have. You know, been a general counsel in three places, uh, seen a lot and learned a lot. And now my, um, you know, the best thing that I get to do on a daily basis is, um, you know, work with my team and to be able to help, um, you know, sort of grow them, um, not just um, professionally, but really be able to help them uh, meet their objectives as well. So Amy, thank you. And I, I loved it as you were talking about how you like to leave an organization in a better place than where you found it. I think we're gonna have to rebrand the Midas touch and make it the Amy touch because it sounds oh. like that's what goes on there. So thank you for that story. Uh, now let's dive in. There's so many pressing issues of the day and I'm sure our, our viewers wanna hear from you, your thoughts on all the latest cutting edge issues. So I'm gonna throw out there for the group to consider. You are individuals who have experienced change. You have influenced change. And you probably are looking for change. So what do you see as the next big shift that either needs to happen or that will happen, whether we like it or not, to legal departments? And uh, Rachel, I'll start with you. I think one area that definitely needs change is the billable hour. It's archaic. It creates the wrong incentives. It drives inefficiencies and 
quite frankly, no one likes it. Like no one likes it. Uh, the lawyers who keep track of their time to the minute and the general counsels who have to purchase this time and review reams of billing of records are unhappy with the system. The simple fact of the matter is that measuring value based on our spent is flawed. It's a flawed concept and it's archaic and we continue to, we continue to use this flawed archaic concept. And the root of the problem is that, you know, time doesn't reflect quality. It doesn't reflect execution and it doesn't reflect deliverables or results. It shouldn't be about how long an attorney took. It should be, what did the attorney accomplish for you? Spending a lot of time on a matter doesn't mean that the time was well spent um, or that the attorney gave you deliverables, much less that the attorney was efficient. And so I think one of the biggest changes that we all need to be reflecting upon is the billable hour and whether or not we want to continue on using the billable hour as a way to measure attorney and pay for attorney work. In reality, I actually think it creates perverse incentives. It penalizes attorneys whose, creative, whose creativity and creative approach to receive a quicker result in problem solving. Um, and it rewards dwindling and it rewards delay. And it rewards extending out problems longer than sometimes they need to be extended. And so this perverse incentive is creative that then leads to um, both unhappy clients and not happy relationships or long-term relationships uh, with counsel and the in-house counsel. I don't think the billable hour aligns with client objectives. I think it's also a roadblock to technology, which I'm sure everybody in here at Clock would, would understand. As we create more technologies, we become more efficient. And when you become more efficient, the, the billable hour uh, doesn't make any sense anymore. And so it's not only incompatible with technology, I would also argue that it's incompatible with work-life balance because you're playing this zero sum game, right? There's only so many hours in a day and the hours you're not spent billing are the hours that you can be spending doing something else or being with your family. And so it's not helpful for the well-being of lawyers or attorneys. And, and finally, I think that it's an outdated method based on uh, what we did in the past. And I think we should all be reflecting and questioning ourselves and thinking what exactly are we really paying for and what do we want to pay for and how do we want to modernize the legal field moving forward? So Rachel, some bold ideas in there, and I bet it resonates with a lot of our audience at Clock. The notion that value isn't tied to some arbitrary number of hours, that value is computed some other way. So I'm curious to know, and I'm sure everyone listening is as well, if not the billable hour, and it creates these perverse incentives, then what's the way forward? So I think that there is this typical pushback to changing the billable hour that you know, legal work is not measurable. And I'm going to disagree with that. Um, we have technologies that measure costs of legal work. Uh, it's not rocket science to price out the deliverables. It just isn't. And so we know how much, you know, for example, a trademark filing costs. We know how much a patent filing costs. We know how much it costs to draft a brief. And we knew how much the last 50 mergers cost. So certainly we can figure out how much the next 50 mergers are going to cost. And so the future of legal to me is designing your services around deliverables, objectives, outcomes and partnership with the business, which is no different than what everybody else seems to be doing in business, right? You ever hire a consultant, you ever hire a banker, you know, all of these uh, other industries aren't just based on time, they're based on deliverables. And so I think that you can structure your legal fees, you know, have I say like, here's the outcome we want, here's what we're working to, here's the work product, and here is a word that, you know, normally we don't see, is a budget, right? And you can create that sort of discussion that creates transparency and certainty. And I would argue it does not necessarily lead to less billing, it leads to more transparency and it means to longevity with your relationship with your client. So to sum up, there are many different ways you can structure legal fees. We have technology these days that can price and estimate legal fees. 
and you can create it based on the outcomes and the deliverables. And I would also be open to, you know, creating incentives so that the deliverables get made and you use technology and you're more efficient, that there's also a reward process to motivate and align the client's interests with that of their outside counsel. Terrific. So thank you for that. And I'll also draw out one of the things that you said really struck home. There's a lot of discussion right now about inclusion and diversity. And I think the point that you made about the billable hour perhaps being inherently unfriendly, perhaps, to women, to family units, to caregivers, and especially in this pandemic year, who, who isn't finding themselves in an unusual situation that might require more personal time than they might have demanded in the past. So a lot of food for thought. You know, Amy or Mark, do you want to add any color? Are you, are you in the camp of down with the billable hour? Or do you have a different approach? You know, I, and Rachel, that was, that was all well said. I mean, this is all stuff that I think we all deal with on a daily, monthly, quarterly, yearly basis when we're thinking about, like you said, budgets, right? Budgets <laughs> that we're dealing with in our, in, our, in our respective roles. I think the one, the one thing is, you know, I think you can price out, pricing of different services and outcomes depending, I think there are tiers and levels, right? And so as you drill down more and more, when I'm thinking, just giving specific examples, when I'm thinking about when I'm doing a deal or things like that, NDAs, I mean, very simple contract, right? I never want to be like, you know, bill an NDA based on hours. Again, perverse incentives. I'm going to bill three hours in this NDA. So things like that, which are, you know, you know, when you talk about the scales of complexity, I think you can price that up fairly easily. And that is, those are the places you start. And when you can, you know, when you have a lot of those things and you can um, bill them based on a, you know, number or, you know, volume, things like that. That gives you much more certainty in terms of um, pricing. Now, as you go up the scale in terms of complexity, I think you get ranges and variability, right? And that, but the, still, you have the conversation in terms of, you know, this is the expectation, this is what we've had in the past, and this is what I think, you know, and give me um, context as to how it can vary. And so the bogey is a little, you know, it, it varies, but you go into comp complex litigation, a complex merge m a a complex fundraising things like that that's when things get a little bit more not murky but variable right and but i totally agree with rachel you can most of this stuff based on the firms and the data things like that and your own experience and other you know and other peers that are doing the same thing you can get pretty good sets of data in terms of comparing what different things or similar things you're doing with others and you use that as a, as a pricing tool now the other thing i think you know, Rachel talked about was transparency, right? And I think, you know, I with all the service providers, and I look at service providers as partners of, you know, wherever I am, you know, it's really about setting expectations and having that open communication with the firms about what you're doing, whether it's internal and external, right? And especially when you're dealing with this animal of big law firms or billing and things like that. And I think setting those expectations in terms of not only pricing and the reality of what you're doing, but about, you know, how you're approaching their legal work for you and that partnership. That's to me, and we can talk about that as long as you guys want, but that to me is sort of on that setting the relationship and the context of what you're doing from, you know, what we call bottom up NDAs all the way up to the most complex stuff. That really giving that understanding to the partners you're working with. I think that actually um, helps them think about outside of just billing hours, right? Really setting goals and objectives and having, giving them the context of what you're trying to accomplish. So those, I mean, it's a softer approach, I think, like on layering on top of what you're doing, but I, do, I, I really do think that makes a difference in, in outcomes and execution when you're, when, you're, when you're doing any project, whether it's an NDA or a complex litigation or complex fundraising or anything like that. Um, so that's really like its holistic approach, right? But Rachel, what you've said is like, I think every, all, we all agree that, you know, we have to be the ones driving that. Um, but there's no reason that there aren't, you know, th there's no reason you can't price things out. I mean, there's just, it's just, it's not, it's impossible to say that now. So Mark, that's terrific. And I think, I think what I hear you saying is that one of the keys to potentially moving away from the billable hour are deeper relationships with our trusted providers. Do you have any tips 
on how you approach that, you know, how, aside from just setting expectations, you know, can you give us an example? What are some of the standards you might expect your providers to meet and how do you encourage that? So there, there, I, I take a multifaceted approach. Number one, I mean, any provider that I use usually is a long-term partner because they understand the approach that I take or similar approaches that we all take in terms of understanding that, you know, look, I look at their work as a partnership going through in terms of helping, you know, me and my firm and my team, you know, execute the goals that we need to execute, right? Sort of, that's the sort of mushy standard I'm looking at, sort of the, the, the macro perspective, right? But then after that, then I drill down in terms of, you know, very much going into how do they build their teams? Who's on, who's working on what matters? Do they understand, you know, what's, you know, let's say it's a big fundraising, for instance, I'll assemble a team and I will make sure they understand, you know, they have, they understand what we're trying to do, you know, who we're working with and what are the key objectives that we want to set in terms of not only just the endpoint, but markers on the way, right? So those are the things that sort of giving people context for me, I find is, 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 is gives that extra sort of motivational push to be more wed to the project. Now, when you go down to hours, right, and building teams and billables for everything, you know, this is a usually a partner level discussion, whether it's a legal provider, a compliance consultant, or anyone that I'm working with at the firm, you know, I have a very frank discussion about what we expect to pay, right? And, but I, I want that to be a back and forth, right? And so the pricing isn't just about, um, you know, here it is, here's what we're going to pay, but like, it's, 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 it's a conversation, right? And I want a realistic assessment also from the provider. So it's the combination of those two things, because as long as there's open communication on both sort of what the objectives that I want to, or we want to achieve, whether it's, we want to fundraise in six months, or we want to do this deal in, in, you know, normal time frame or compressed time frame. all those factors go in and we discuss that and that goes into the pricing discussion. I think the worst thing anyone can do in this in this role is just say, hey, here's what we need to do, go do it, right? That's, and sometimes you just don't have time, honestly, right, for certain things. And I think for the, what I saw the scale things like NDAs or simple things like that, that you can simply say, just go do it. Here's the process. There's not much sort of stuff that you need to do on a softer approach, but on the more complex things or the things that really can cost a lot of money, um, having that deeper discussion initially about goals, how it varies from normal process, you know, the team that's there, the expectations on pricing and the discussion, putting that time in initially, I think does pay off in terms of execution and also in terms of, you know, getting people within the pricing ranges generally that you talk about um, within the construct of the billable hour, right? Because some things, you know, the firms are so institutionalized, the big ones in terms of the, that structure. But the more and more you kind of have these conversations, the more seeds you plant, especially with the younger partners that are going through and the teams about, wait, okay, everyone's talking about this. And as they sort of mature in those roles, they're more open to it. So it's sort of, you know, I, I look at it as a long-term game also in terms of like changing perspectives in the firms that I deal with. Terrific. So thank you, Mark. And I think we're all thinking, you know, man, what a year of it just passed by. So some of the things we're talking about are longstanding principles and other things uh, might have been turbocharged by the experience that we all went through and are continuing to go through. So Amy, I'll, I'll pose a question to you. What do you think about the need for speed? Uh, you know, when you approach your work as a GC now at multiple companies, you know, what are, how do you prioritize and how do you do things with pragmatism and with agility? Talk to us about your approach. Well, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, I think it connects so well with the um, previous discussion with respect to the billable hour, because unlike me, the, you know, the majority of folks in-house uh, have spent time in law firms. Um, and so those, um, you know, the, uh, the billable hour, the approach that are taking um, in firms in relationship to making sure that there's sort of white glove service or that everything is perfect um, or that, um, 
um, that you're spending, you know, X amount of time, even though it may not be necessary in order to get um, uh, an objective accomplished, um, you know, a project accomplished sort of feeds into uh, what you try to be able to do sort of in-house. So for us, it's, it's really being able to, it's been sort of a, a you know, career-wide um, sort of uh, effort for me um, of being able to take, you know, like the way you gather that, that kind of risk perspective of being able to say, you know, how likely is something going to occur and what's really the impact to the business? So, you know, uh, you know when you deal with more junior um, lawyers, of course, coming um, from uh, law firms, you start thinking about, you know, how can I give those uh, lawyers more of that pragmatic context for the business faster? Like, I don't want them to have to work for 25 years, like I did, and sort of, get, you know, gather it sort of one at a time, right? And then you all of a sudden sort of, you know, of course, you know, with your judgment and, you know, experience, you could be able to assess the risk much, much more quickly than, than someone who has been in, in-house um, for a short period of time. And so the real focus I have is asking those two questions. They're not, you know, this is not um, rocket science by any um, stretch of the imagination, right? It's part of risk management anyway, but it's really being able to, lawyers are taught to spot the issue and they want to complete the analysis and want to make it as, um, as complete and thoughtful as possible. But, you know, in-house you do that and some of the most challenging or most concerning issues can be walking right out the door, right? Unless you are a timely and you understand how to address sort of your own time, uh, money, how you spend money, um, both uh, in-house and also with um, external uh, counsel, um, it matters, right, to be able to assess it. So, you know, I use lots of um, examples, but uh, uh, in the past, but some, you know, minor things would come up to me as general counsel, and I'd be like, guys, why are we even worrying about this? You know, how likely is it really going to occur? And even if it does, what's the worst thing? You know, go to the worst case scenario. What is the worst thing that's going to happen, right? And then when you look at that, you say, well, why are we spending so much time on this, right? And, and honestly, if you don't sort of um, learn how to prioritize your, um, the challenges that come in house, you are going to, you know, just be on sort of like this, you know, endless wheel and you're not going to be effective, right? Because you are, you know, unless you are moving, you know, to be able to address and can quickly assess the risk, it's really, really going to be um, sort of difficult for you to be as effective with your clients um, and to be able to represent the shareholders the way you would like to. So, um, you know, it doesn't always, uh, um, yeah, I, I've used sort of what I try to do with some of the more, um, the folks who, who find sort of an interest in it is to be able to sort of just very quickly be able to take a piece of paper, put it in fours, right? And how likely is it going to occur? And what's the impact to the business? And then just have the lawyers talk among themselves, you know, either with, um, you know, peers or with their managers and be able to just plot it somewhere right? And sort of just put it somewhere on this grid. Um, and then, you know, talk to others and then be able to say, does it really belong there or not? Right? So it at least allows you to say before you do any legal analysis, okay, I just want you to answer two questions. And then you could sort of plot it on this graph and then be able to say, hmm, based on that, right? How much energy, how much effort should I really um, be exerting to be able to deal with this challenge versus another? And in a lot of cases, you know, I've done this and the first time you do it, it's all, you know, up into the, um, the right, right? So it's an, everything's the most important, you know, the impact of the company is gonna be tremendous and the likelihood of it occurring is going to be, you know, um, you know at least higher than likely, um, you know, with someone who had had more experience. So part of that is just honing that skill, but it's a great way to be able to just talk it through and if people do it, you know, on a consistent basis, you can really see that that need for um, speed, uh, you know, and risk assessments are done um, a lot quicker than maybe 25 years and how long it took me to be able to look at a problem and say, does that really matter um, or not? So terrific. So I think we're hearing some themes emerge here. So if the question is what what either needs to change or should change in the view of this esteemed GC panel, we're hearing changes to the billable hour model, 
deeper relationships of trust, which enable you to do more advanced things with your partners. And of course, better training, deeper and faster experience so people can work faster and smarter. And I'll challenge this group and say, you know, what else? You know, as you look around the corner, are there any other things that you think are ripe for change in this industry? Well, I think, you know, what Amy is sort of touching upon what you just said, I completely agree with you. And um, because of the law school model being very theoretical, one of the things that I started uh, co-teaching class uh, about six years ago at Columbia Law School was a pragmatic course. And I'm going to take some of your ideas on that, uh, on boxing it out, because I, I think that's exactly the type of lessons that need to be ingrained in these law students moving forward as we modernize, as we bring in technology, uh, as we want to become more efficient and more practical. And so this course uh, that we teach is basically the students are simulated. They are in-house counsel. Uh, we created a fake company at a virtual technology company. We call it Vision Enterprises. It's all fake. Uh, it's based off of like Facebook's Oculus, right? And each week they have to deal with real life problems and they have to figure out the solutions. Now there comes a time when the problems escalate and they have to hire outside counsel. So we bring in outside counsel and they pitch to the students. And it's this, and I remember when I first went to Columbia Law School about this and I said, so I have this idea, exactly what you're saying. Like these students need to learn practical skills. They need to learn how the theoretics of the law apply to businesses if they wanna go in to business, right? Um, and so I, so I went with my co-teacher and we said, here's what we want to do. We want to teach these students how to do cost benefit analysis, how to think through what is the worst outcome here and how to actually apply their legal skills in a way that matches the client's objectives uh, that is less necessarily academic. And I do think having academics and having the foundations and the basics of law are just as important. But I think we also need to modernize the education system. And people need to know about clock and they need to know about legal technology. And I can tell you, we teach about the legal technologies that's out there. And every single one of our students writes us and tells us how interested they're learning and how interested they're learning to learn about legal technologies and efficiencies. Because this new generation comes in and says, you know, I don't want to sit here and review documents all day. I want to learn how to review documents and apply artificial intelligence to get a better work product. That's the current thinking of the new generation. And I think that the starting is to embrace it and to embrace it early on and to get law schools to start teaching more practical courses along with the foundational basics. So that, you know, as you just said, Amy, that when you do you know, have an in-house counsel or an outside counsel, they've been trained to not just understand the principles of law, but how to apply it. And I think that that is the future and where things should go. And I think to Mark to also, I would say that when that happens, we will be building better relationships with our clients. So I'll pose another question to the group. Obviously our panel today is focused on legal operations of tomorrow. And everyone on this panel obviously went to law school and is a lawyer and is a general counsel. What do you think about legal operations professionals? Obviously, there's a mixture out there, folks who went to law school, some who didn't, some who lived in the legal world, others who come at it from a different direction, like uh, the business side. You know, what's your vision of legal operations of tomorrow and what's the right mix of people to be part of a legal operations team? Well, um, let, me, let me just start. Um, I think it's the best thing that was ever created right, um, in so many different ways. Um, you know, because I lived without that um, function for a long time. And then when I came to VMware and we had the, um, <clears throat> we, we had the, um, the function of legal operations, it was just phenomenal, right? So first of all, you know, we are more, we like to think of ourselves a little bit more like, uh, at least, you know, uh, I'll generalize for a moment as like artists instead of scientists, right? And so since I've been working in tech my whole career, they've been talking about sort of data, 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 right? Uh, it's all about the data. Uh, and then you sort of look at us as, as um, lawyers and you're like, what data, right? You know, for us, it's all about, you know, judgment calls and, 
you know, and degrees of risk, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, but what to me, the big sort of change and as well as being able to have um, uh, legal operations, I don't care so much, you know, I guess I'm a, I'm a little bit maybe uh, very uh, flexible, you know, it, it's sort of a can-do attitude, right? So, I mean, you know, lawyers will bring, I have worked and seen people in the, those roles that are lawyers and non-lawyers. And I don't think it matters. I think that their, their background, right? Uh, and their willingness to learn is what really matters, right? Um, and sort of, and sort of the, the antithesis of the way other lawyers think, right? So when I'm talking about data, 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 how am I making decisions and how are things gonna change? Everything is gonna be changed based on sort of data. Like, oh, okay. Like even simple things, like we were assessing, okay, well, we have some contract professionals that work with us. We have lawyers that work with us in our commercial um, work. You know, someone leaves, who do we hire? Do we just backfill? We just sort of like say, okay, do we need someone? Do we not need someone? At what level do we need them, et cetera, right? And you're like, we just, for like ever, all we did was, um, you know, sort of, it's a gut feel. You know, now we're going to be able to, you know, since, you know, with a lot of the technology that we've been able to um, implement, um, you're able to really assess sort of what does the data tell you, right? It is just one factor in making the decision, but it's, it's uh, we're, we're sometimes um, sort of slow as a profession to change. Um, and so now we have a host of um, opportunities to be able to, you know, embrace different technologies and become, you know, more impactful to the business. To me, these technologies are really a means to an end and the professionals who really help us look across the board at all of our operations and make us more effective, allow us to be more relevant to the business. That's the point, right? Um, because you're optimizing um, the, the, uh, the expense, you're optimizing on the real experience um, and how you can help, meaning that people who know the business, know the technology, if that's whatever, you know, know your competition, understand the environment, right? The more and more that we have data and the more and more that we're more effective in doing that, you know, the, the business looks at us as partners, not um, just as sort of, uh, you know, I have to go through legal or a tax on my operations or things like that. Terrific, all right. Mark, what do you think? So, you know, I, I look at this almost more as, as even more specific as a specific role or a function, right? And, and this not for me as I scaled this where I am B capital. I mean, this is something I'm thinking about for the long term, but I've seen it in other places and these ideas thrown around. It's really almost like a, you know, I've always worked with a CEO of a business very close, closely um, and CFOs and things like that. But the, it, I think from a legal perspective, right, where we're sort of, when we're thinking about what we do substantively, and then there's another side, which is a big substantive side is running sort of the legal operation, right? And I think that that lack of perspective or training that comes with just training, but the thing is organizations like clock and things like that. I think the one thing I do see coming out hopefully in the future, which I think will be, you know, as more people adopt it, people have already doing that is having some type of almost legal COO role as you grow bigger and scaling, because there's a whole business for how I mean, legal is one part, especially as you scale in anywhere. It's, it's, it's a part of the business, right? It's generally seen as a cost center. It could be seen as a, you know, a, a cost generator or, you know, whatever the model is, but usually a cost center, right? But it's attaching to different parts of the, the firm as you're going through and having that sort of a relationship point of view, whereas the general counsel, other people, you can adopt that view or having that type of perspective or training imparted on general counsels as they're growing the firm, or honestly having some, um, and preferably a non-lawyer or a recovering lawyer, you know, be a, you know, coming in as almost like a COO, right? Because that, you know, that obviously comes with scale, but I think that is something that internally and then externally as you're talking about that, I do see that role growing. And it's something I've read, you know, talk to people about other things, but I, that expansion, I think, Will probably come you know faster than people think um as you know different companies scale right and it's just going to be one of those things where like why don't we have someone thinking about the, the business side and the sort of the growth and the operation side of a legal department within a larger department and also looking externally i think that's a great 
I, no, I was going to say, Rachel, do you want to have the last word on that? But you're already grabbing it. <laughs> yeah, because I just think that was such a great part, point, Mark. Like, le- like, the legal department in a business also needs to be run like a business to some extent, right? You can't just forget that you are a contributing member to your company. And that's important that you take some of the good parts of the business and you can integrate it within the legal team, right? And so yeah. what I... At the end of the day, I think that legal operations is the single best way to modernize the legal industry. And it's coming. And there are other you know, folks that are also coming, such as the big four accounting firms are starting to develop legal technologies to come into the space. So if the law firms don't adapt, um, they're going to find themselves in a position where other people will adapt. So I think that um, at the end of the day, everything we talked about with respect to the billable hour, with respect to budgeting, with respect to client relations, a lot of it is tied to understanding your legal operations and understanding the technologies that are out there in order to make you a more productive, efficient, executing legal department. And so when you actually break down certain laws, which i done repeatedly is, you know, is the word, you know, there are repeatable tasks that you do in law. It's true. There's a large part of law that's creative and it's development, but there's also a large part of law that's about precedent. And whether you want to look at it from a corporate pr- perspective, right, you know, you can sit there and you used to do like an agreement and then someone would be like, oh yeah, this reminds me of this agreement we did like last year. And then you'd go and pull this agreement you did last year and you'd search for it. And then you'd say, oh yeah, I think that clause reminds me of a clause we did. Well, you know, these new generation of students are coming in and being like, that is the most inefficient thing I've ever seen. Like, why don't we have a database of all the different clauses that we've done, which uh, exactly what we're developing right now at IEX, right? And we should have rules and we should have contract mapping and we should use a contract software that tells us that we've had this contract and we're going to get it reviewed and, and negotiated within 48 hours, right? And we should have metrics put to this and we should have timing put to this and we should have deliverables put to this. And so I think legal ops, I look at it from two different ways. One, increasing efficiencies, killing the billable hour, which I'd be completely happy with, um, and becoming more productive in a legal department. But I also see it as it's going to touch upon substantive legal matters as well. The artificial intelligence is going to get smart enough to know that it can search the case law. It can search the SEC Edgar database and pull out, um, you wanna know what clause someone did for indemnity for a merger? I'll give you five indemnity merger clauses that were just recently enacted. Um, It will do sort of helpful tasks like that so that we're no longer moving backwards in our archaic world and we're moving forward. And that technology is both being embraced on the corporate side to help with efficiencies but also on the legal side to help with the substantive matters of cases or corporate work. And I think it's coming and I think it's been slower than I would have liked to see. Um, But I think clock is a testament to um, the popularity and it just takes more collaboration with the legal teams and technology to get us to the next level, which I hope is around the corner. Fantastic. So as everyone was talking, it reminds me of that William Gibson quote that is oft quoted, and I'll try not to mangle it, which is the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. And we probably see that today in the sense that we have only the most enlightened GC on this particular panel, but not every organization is necessarily there yet. So for our closer, let's do a speed round and I will ask each of our GC, if you're in an organization that wants to push forward to this future state where legal operations is just part of the fabric and these issues are being grappled with appropriately, what can you do to influence that change? And let's do this speed round style. Just give us a couple of couple of sentences at most. And let's start with Amy. What do you do? All you have to do is, um, <clears throat> All you have to do is be able to come, let let me show you um, sort of before and after, right? And and really what um, can be accomplished with a phenomenal operations team for the legal department. Uh, Frees you up to be able to do other things, um, but it also is just invaluable uh, in our our roles. Fantastic. Mark, you're up. What should they do to be the change? 
Come with a plan. <laughs> come with a plan. And this is going off what Amy's saying is that come with a plan of how things will change and what the goals are and convince people that you're going to get there. And, and then once you do, then that will accelerate. So the micro changes, the things that you come with the plans, and then you accelerate to the bigger things. That's the way I've gotten sort of, you know, you take steps and you convince people and then you pull them along once those things, those first initial things are done and then more lights click on. Fantastic. Rachel, bring it home. Well, I'm going to agree with both Mark and Amy. I'm going to start by saying the billable hour is miserable and we should stop using it. And we should come up with a plan of deliverables and outcomes that align the interests of the lawyers with the in-house counsel. And as Amy also said, we need to build relationships, be more efficient, come with deliverables and stop focusing on time. Time alone does not demonstrate success, outcomes, anything. It's just time. We should be focusing on, as Mark and Amy said, building our plan, modernizing, embracing technology and moving forward. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Amy. Sincerely from the entire clock community for taking the time to share your views, your experience and your thoughts on what the future of legal operations and legal might hold. Thank you again to our general session sponsor Bloomberg Law. And of course, thank you everyone who took the time out from the clock community to attend today uh, for joining us today and just for being a part of the clock community at large. We look forward to seeing you in person one of these days, but in the meantime, be well, be safe. <laughs>